what if I have the limit as x approaches 2 of the function 4x cubed minus 6x squared minus 9x? Okay, so this is your classic polynomial. What do you think is going to apply here? Well, I've already told you, how would you do this? I said, hey, just plug it in, right? That's what I've already told you. But really what's happening is you have this term, which is a function, this is a function, and this is a function, and they're all subtracted. So basically you're gonna use the difference uh, guy here, which says that I can take the limit of each individual thing and then subtract them. So whenever I take the limit of each individual thing, I'm essentially gonna be plugging in values. So what I'm gonna have is, as I do this, four times two to the third, um, and then I'm going to have minus 6 times 2 squared minus 9 times 2, like this. And so ultimately what's going to happen, let's go over here, is I'm going to have 4 times 2 to the third is going to actually be 8. And then I'm going to have minus 6 times 4 minus, and I'll just say minus 18. 9 times 2 is 18. Okay, so what I'm going to have is 32 minus 24 minus 18. And ultimately, the final answer here is going to be negative 10. If you actually do this minus this minus this, you get negative 10. So the point is, is by plugging it in the way I told you before, this is a smooth continuous function. All, by the way, all polynomials are smooth and continuous. So you can always plug in the value to get the limit for any polynomial. What's happening is you're doing the limit for each individual thing here. Okay. So let's move on to another problem. What if I have the limit? as x approaches 0 of the function 1 over x. Well, I've already told you um, to give it a shot to go ahead and try to plug it in, okay? Um, but really what's happening is notice that you have a top and a bottom. So basically you can end up using this quotient. You can take the limit as the function uh, approaches the limit on the top and the limit of the bottom function approaching the same thing. So what you have on the top is the limit as of x approaches 0 of the number 1 on the top and the limit as x approaches 0 of the, uh, the function x on the bottom. Okay. Now you can continue to, to use this and use additional limit laws. What is the limit of a constant? The limit of a constant for any value that you approach is just the same constant because it's a flat horizontal line. So on the top you're going to just have 1. And on the bottom, the limit as x approaches 0 of x, you already know you can plug it in, but you see that it's just another limit law here. So it's just going to be the value that you're approaching. So we plug 0 in, and it's going to go here. Now, yes, this does give you kind of a weird answer, 1 over 0. But if you think about it, as you get closer and closer and closer to 0, but never quite get there, you're going to be dividing by smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller numbers. So what's going to really happen is this limit is going to approach infinity. And if you actually uh, plot this, you will see that it does approach infinity uh, as, you, as you get there. Okay? Now, it depends potentially on what direction you're approaching uh, infinity from, because this guy, I don't want to get too deep into this right now, but basically you have x and you have f of x. Okay? So what's going to happen is if I'm approaching from this way, I'm dividing by smaller and smaller positive values. So what's going to happen if I come this way is I go to infinity like that. Okay? But if I approach from the other way, I'm going to be approaching zero from smaller and smaller negative values. But these are negative values, so it's actually going to be coming down like that, okay? going to negative infinity. So I'm kind of playing fast and loose with this just because I'm trying to teach you the limit laws. But really, it approaches positive infinity if I'm coming from the right, and if it approaches negative infinity if I'm coming from the left. But just kind of put that in your back pocket. You know, the main point of this is to teach you the limit laws which is saying that you can take the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom. Okay? All right, the next one, what if I have the limit as x approaches 16 of the function negative 1 half times the square root of x? How would I approach that? Well, you already know. Try to plug it in, see if you get a weird answer. But really what's happening is this is a constant times a function. And you know that if I have the limit of a constant times a function, I just take the constant out and then take the limit of the function. So what happens is this is negative one half times the limit of x approaching 16 of the square root of x. And then you say, well, how do I do this limit? How do I do the limit? Well, you know you can plug it in, but if you want to look for a limit, uh, uh, not a limit law, a limit law, in this case, it's written as an nth root, whether it's a square root or a cube root or whatever. In our case, we know it's a square root, so basically you plug in a and it'll be the square root. 
as we have already guessed. So what we have is negative one half times the square root of 16. You basically plug this in, and what you will get is negative one half times four, because the square root of 16 is four, and then what you'll have, four divided by two is two, so it'd be negative two, and this is the final answer. Negative two, okay? Let me switch colors. What if you have the limit as x approaches four of three x squared minus five times the square root of x minus six times the absolute value of x? All right, so again, it's the same sort of thing. You have a function here, a function here, and a function here, so I can subtract them or they are subtracted, so I can take the limit of each individual thing separately. That's kind of the punchline here that you need to know. I can take the limit of this, the limit of this, and the limit of this. As I'm working with this one, I already know I can plug it in to the value here. As I'm working with this one with square roots, we've done one just like it, I can plug the value in here. And absolute value is also behaves in a similar way. I can plug the value in there. So that is what allows me to just plug it in everywhere because I can basically subtract the answer. So what I'm gonna get, is three times four squared minus five times the square root of four minus six times the absolute value of four. And so what I'm gonna get is four times, or four squared is 16, so three times 16 minus five times two, because the square root of four is two, minus six times four, because the absolute value of four is just four, okay? So what I will get over here, three times 16 is 48, minus 5 times 2 is 10, and then this will be 24. Minus 10 minus 24, and whenever you do that, you will get the answer of 14. So as you can see, the concept here is not crazy difficult to follow, and you already have a lot of experience with this. What if I take the limit as x approaches the square root of 2, because x can approach any number, right? x squared plus 5, square root of 2 times x plus 1, okay? Well, first of all, notice that this is one giant function multiplied by another giant function, and you know from the limit laws that we have on the other board, when you have two functions multiplied, you take the limit of the first one times the limit of the second one. So if I want to write this out in all of its glory, uh, what it basically is going to be is the limit as x approaches the square root of 2 of x squared plus 5, and then I can multiply that whatever I get from that times the limit as x approaches the square root of 2 of square root of 2 times x plus 1. All right, so then whenever I want to take the limit of this guy, you know from experience that you just plug it, basically you can just plug it in. And when you get that, you take the square root of 2 and stick it in there, square root of 2 squared plus 5. So I'll keep that wrapped up in parentheses. Open in other parentheses, I'll stick this one in. I have a square root of two from here, but then I'm multiplying by another square root of two, put a little dot there, as I'm plugging this in here, and then I have a plus one. So here, the square root, if you take the square of a square root, that they basically canceled, so I have two plus five left, left over in here. And then if I have this, when you multiply two radicals, you multiply the insides under the radical, and that remains four. Two times two is four, and you basically combine them into one radical like that. So what I have here, two plus five is seven, and inside here, the square root of four will be two plus one, so it's seven times three, which is 21, and that's the final limit. So basically, it's just an example showing you that if you have two functions multiplied, no matter what they look like, you can apply the limit separately. But in practice, you don't really have to write it out like this because it's the same thing as just plugging it in. If I plug this in here and plug this in here, and you're, you're going to end up multiplying the results anyway. So you don't really have to write all of this stuff, all of these limits everywhere. You can. You don't have to. Um, as long as you know what's legal and what's not legal. Now let's do one that's just a touch more challenging. What if I have the limit as y approaches 4 of the function y to the 5 halves times y to the 1 half plus y to the negative 1 half. I love this problem because it's one of those that looks really hard at first because of the fractional exponents everywhere, but then you realize, wait a minute, fractional exponents, they're no different from regular exponents, really. They behave in the same way. And I basically have a function here times another giant function there. So the way this is gonna work is I can multiply these limits together. So it'll be the limit y approaching four 
of the first function, y to the 5 halves, and then I'm going to multiply that result times the limit as y approaches 4 of y to the 1 half plus y to the negative 1 half. All I've done is I've taken the limit of this one times the limit of this one. That's all I've done. I've just rewritten the thing. But then I realize, before I even do this limit, I realize this is just the sum of two functions here. So really, I can further go and say limit as y approaches 4 of y to the 5 halves. And then this is the sum. So I can just write it as the sum of two limits. y approaches 4, y to the 1 half, plus the limit as y approaches 4 of y to the negative 1 half. Okay, so you understand you're just using every little limit law along the way here. Now, since this is a, um, uh, a, a variable raised to a power you already learned from the other limit law that we've written on the board, that you just basically plug it in. So what we have here is 4 to the 5 halves power. And in here we do the same thing. We have 4 to the 1 half power, and we have 4 to the negative 1 half power. Now these fractional exponents shouldn't scare you, but you do need to remember a little bit of algebra to know what to do. When you have something to the uh, uh, 4 fifths or 5 halves power like this, whatever is in the top of the fraction is just a regular power. Whatever's on the bottom is like a root. So what you have is 4 raised to the power of 5 and then take the square root. Okay, That's what that means. And if you don't remember that, you should probably go back to algebra a little bit. Or you can do it in reverse order. You could say 4 square root and take the result and raise it to the power of 5. And I'm going to do it that way because I know that the square root of 4 is 2. So this is going to be 2 to the fifth power. I'm choosing to do the square root first and then raising the result there. And then inside here I have the square root of 4, which is 2. And then here, this is basically over here, this is the same as 1 over 4 to the 1 half. So I have basically 1 over 2 over there, okay? And so ultimately, 2 to the fifth power is 32. And on the inside, when you have 2 plus 1 halves, and you do that math there, it'll be 5 halves. You can convince yourself of that. And then you have 32 divided by 2 is 16. Don't forget to multiply by the 5 that's still there. And 16 times 5 uh, is 80. And that is the final answer for that problem. So again, it looks very messy the way I've written it, but just keep in mind I'm only doing this because I'm trying to show you these limit laws and how to apply them. I see that I have two functions multiplied, so I write two limits of two giant functions multiplied. And then I see that this limit is really the sum of two functions, so I write them as the sum of two limits, and then I go and solve everything. But really, if you wipe all this off the board and just realize, hey, this looks like a well-behaved function, I'm just going to plug it in everywhere, it's exactly the same as what I've done. So the whole concept of the limit laws, they're important for sure, but I've already kind of taught you intuitively what to do with limits without even really knowing those laws exist. But that's where they come from. So here's the last problem we're gonna do here. If I have the limit as x goes to the fraction one over 27 of the following function, x to the two thirds minus one ninth over x to the one-third minus one-third. So there I go. I have a big function like that, and it's a rational function because I have a, it's written as a fraction. Well, the first thing I've taught you to do, you know, many times, or I guess I should tell you, this is, you can use the limit laws. You go back here, and just remember that the quotient of two functions, you can take the limit of the top, divide by the limit of the bottom. So we're going to attempt to do that. Um, and so what's going to end up happening is you're going to have the limit of x approaching 1 over 27 of x to the 2 thirds minus 1 ninth. And then on the bottom, you'll have the limit of x approaching 1 over 27 of x to the 1 third minus 1 third. So I'm just showing you that the limit laws are, are fully applicable. All right, now what's going to happen, though, is you're going to run into problems because what's going to happen here is you're going to put this in, it's going to be 1 over 27, but you're going to raise it to the 2 thirds power minus 1 ninth. And then on the bottom, you're going to have this guy here, 1 over 27 raised to the 1 third minus 1 third. Now let's just crank through this and see what we get. Remember, when you have a fractional power, this is like raising to the power of 2 and then taking a cube root, or you can go in reverse order. You can take the cube root first and then raise it to the power of 2. I'm going to take the 
cube root first because I know that the cube root of 27 is 3 because 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 again is 27. So over here, when I take the cube root, what I'm going to get is 1 third squared minus 1 ninth. Don't forget, I took the cube root, but I still have to square it from over there. On the bottom, I'm going to have the same thing, 1 third minus 1 third. So here, when I square this, I'll have 1 ninth minus 1 ninth, and by now you can probably see the problem because this is 0 over 0, and that's not going to work. So it didn't work, not because the limit laws, the limit laws were fine, it's just the same kind of problem we ran into before. When you get to an indeterminate form like 0 over 0, you have to simplify somehow. So we want to simplify this guy, and we suspect that there's going to be a difference of two squares involved because we see these minus signs. We also see a 3 and a 9, and I've been trying to condition you, anytime you see things that are perfect squares like that, it's probably a difference of two squares problem. So you have to start asking yourself, how can I rewrite this as a difference of two squares? Well, I told you this is really x cube root and then squared. So if I write it like that, x cubed root and then squared, because remember, these exponents can be multiplied together, a power raised to a power, um, you multiply them, which will be two thirds, okay? One ninth, as you should already know, can be written as one third squared. So now I have the difference of two squareds on the top. And on the bottom, I'm stuck with x to the one-third minus one-third. And by now, you should know where we're going with this. Since this is a difference of two squares, what you really have is x to the one-third minus one-third, x to the one-third plus one-third, and then on the bottom, you have x to the one-third minus one-third. And now you see why we did it because when we do the difference of two squares, this cancels with this. And so now I'm left with the limit as x goes to one over 27 of x to the one third plus one third. And now, again, this is the sum of two functions, which means I do the limit of this and the limit of this separately and add them, which is exactly the same as just plugging the thing in. So what I get is one over 27, all raised to the one third power and what is the one-third power, by the way? It's a cube root. So I know that this is going to be the cube root of the top is one, and the cube root of the bottom is three. So it's one-third plus one-third, which is two-thirds, since they already have a common denominator. And that's the answer, two-thirds. So this was really a very similar problem to what we've done in the past. Don't let the, pow the exponents trip you up too much. When you see a fractional exponent, you need to think of it um, in two in two fashions. So you need to think of it, instead of a weird two-thirds, think of it as, okay, this is squared and then the, the cube root. Or you can think of it as the cube root and then the square. That will allow you to separate things in a manner in which that can help you simplify. But the point is, is that the quotient law, I mean, all of this stuff still applies to all the problems that we've done in the past. It's just now you have these things called limit laws in your back pocket, and if you had to prove that one of these limits were correct on a test or something, if they if the professor said, hey, I want you to do this limit, I want you to tell me which laws you're using along the way, now you'll know how to go through here and how to use them there. So we've, up until this point, we've really covered the lion's share of limit theory. You've learned the definition, you've got lots of practice. Now we're gonna devote the last few sections to covering some important theorems that are usually taught when you learn limits in calculus. And, and they're easy to understand if I just draw a few nice pictures. So follow me on to the next section where we'll start tackling that uh, in Calculus 1. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.